Welcome everybody. This is uh, the Saturday afternoon project update meeting, Conway Center Flood Mitigation MVP project. Um, we're, uh, speaker is Nicholas Miller, who I love his job title, fluvial geomorphologist. Geomorphologist, yep. which is really cool. Um, if you have too many syllables to pronounce coherently, that's a great job. Um, and also Rosalie Starbridge from, from GZA, which is the consultant um, that is part of this grant as well. So, um, welcome. All right. Well, thank you, Phil, and thank you, everyone, for giving up part of your Saturday to be here. Um, before we go any further, I'll just, I mean, the next slide is kind of an agenda of what we're going to talk about. This is not the meeting where we give you all the modeling results and talk about how, you know, we can mitigate flooding in Conway. That's where we're hoping to go with this, but this is kind of a, a, a different sort of meeting. That meeting will happen later in the spring, kind of date to be determined. Um, but today we wanted to start by talking about some of the recent floods and challenges that Conway and Ashfield have faced uh, in the last you know, 15 years. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, sort of how we got here and the long history of channel modification and uh, flooding that's happened in these communities uh, historically. Then we'll go through kind of the past projects in the watershed, um, kind of highlighting some of what we've done uh, with grant money so far. Um, and then we'll talk about the strategies for flood mitigation by highlighting some case studies from around the region, um, how other communities dealt with uh, flooding issues and erosion hazards. Um, then we have our next steps for this meeting, for this project, and uh, then we'll like to open it up for some discussion and questions. We really want to get some input from residents and landowners, you know, see what ideas other people have, um, what do you see as the, the hazards, risks, and you know, um, just we can discuss possible solutions uh, going forward. So that's a big part of this project. Uh, so the flood and erosion hazards that the residents of Conway and Ashfield are experiencing, whether those be from Tropical Storm Irene, which uh, flooded the fields at natural roots and washed out the retaining wall here at the Pumpkin Hollow and South River Confluence, that's a downstream shot of the newly installed retaining wall right after Irene when it was washed away uh, at the Main Street Bridge in downtown Conway. Um, you know, then these flood and erosion hazards happened again this past year in July. Fields Hill Road going out, washing away, stranding a lot of residents up that road. Um, all that sediment was mobilized, came down the slope, and filled in the Conway swimming pool. We also had flood damages in July along Shelburne Falls Road, where there's still cones out and there's been repeated failures along the South River. I, I don't have a picture up here, but I could easily have a picture of the Route 116 damages going down to Deerfield and how that route was compromised during the July flooding. Um, there was a lot of erosion on agricultural lands. This is a parcel on Shelburne Falls Road, a lot of you may be familiar with, but there were also a lot of residential losses and, uh, and other infrastructure. But well, all those damages, whether it be from erosion or flood inundation, have a history in the legacy of historic land use. This is a, you know, a, a woodblock print or a drawing, um, supposedly showing the southern view of Conway around 1799, turn of you know, 1800. Um, what I want you to notice here is how the hillsides are completely denuded of trees. Um, Scholars who study this talk about it as a near total deforestation of the New England landscape. That land clearance peaked in 1850. Um, and the important thing about that is it mobilized a lot of the sediment from the, when you took the old growth forests away. All that sediment came off the steep hillsides and down to the valley bottoms. And it was delivered down to the valley bottoms 
by really efficient transport mechanism because all the river channels had been straightened. <laughs> in the South River watershed, when we've done mapping, two thirds of the ri river channel length, we can you know, distinctly say was artificially straightened. That was straightened for a lot of different reasons, but in the South River, primarily it was straightened to bring uh, the water down to mills. And all those straight channels led to mill races and canals, which powered the colonial economy of Asheville and Conway. Channel manipulation meant a lot of dams along the South River and, and <coughs> on tributaries in the watershed. That image on the left is the Tucker and Cook Reservoir, which also here referred to as the Conway Reservoir. This uh, was a very large lake just upstream of Conway Center. Um, the dam remains are off Eldridge Road. Um, and then this dam here, which everyone calls the Big Dam, and the Big Dam was downstream of most of the residents of Conway, but that was a dam that powered the trolley line. The trolley, of course, went from Conway to Shelburne all the way up to Coleraine. Right? So we manipulated the channels by straightening them. We mobilized the sediments off the hillsides by clearing the land. And we delivered that sediment down to the valley bottoms where we built a lot of dams. A lot of that sediment ended up behind dams. And, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that, but that's not necessarily the focus of this talk. Um, the other issue going on is in New England, we've got you know, very narrow valleys, and so historically the settlement patterns were to build all the infrastructure, housing, industry, all along the river corridor. And you can get a sense of that in that this um, old map from 1871. Um, this is the Main Street Bridge here. Um, you can see all these houses and mills and businesses all built along the river, right? There's not a lot of land. Otherwise, you're on the steep valley side slopes. So they, they developed right along the river corridor. And in fact, we also not only built our houses along the river corridor, we also built our roads. This is a picture of Route 116 in South Ashfield, um, where they basically filled in part of the river channel to build the road. So we encroached upon the river. And then we, uh, where we have crossings, we built incompatible infrastructure, right? Undersized culverts, um, Old Cricket Hill Road here in Conway, Creamery Road here in Ashfield. Um, just some examples of these high hazard areas um, where you've got a lot of sediment and a lot of water moving very quickly down to an undersized constricted crossing. Um, that creates problems at the crossing with potential blowouts, but also flooding upstream. Basically acts as a dam during the flood. On top of all this, we've got an increase in the frequency and magnitude of extreme weather events, thanks to climate change. Um, this graph here shows Tropical Storm Irene in 2011. This is a graph of the highest annual flow from the USGS gauge and on the South River and Conway every year since 1965 when the gauge was first put in. Notice the average annual peak is down here about 2,600 cubic feet per second and Irene was up here for over 12,000. It was a big flow, right? We're getting a lot more big flood events. Bigger flood events, much more frequent, getting a lot of rain on snow events as everyone has experienced just yesterday, but throughout this, this whole winter. Um, so how do we deal with these issues? Right, that's what this project is supposed to be about. We're supposed to look at strategies for the towns for you know, building climate resiliency. So this next part of the talk, I want to highlight some of the past efforts we've already done. Um, some of these will include looking at you know, proactive ways to, to manage lands and work with on conservation. Uh, so we've worked with the towns, the Franklin Land Trust, um, watershed management and planning. There have been a lot of you know, Deerfield River Basin scale planning projects, but also South River specific planning projects. Um, FERCOG has been very instrumental in those efforts. 
Um, we can look at forestry and agricultural best management practices, sometimes partnering with federal agencies like the Farm Service Agency and Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and we can talk about and try to get money for, because that's the big part, right? Improving and modernizing the infrastructure, whether that be on town roads, mass DOT uh, roads, or you know, other infrastructure as well. Um, and then, of course, we can look at river and floodplain restoration, and some of those efforts have been led by FERCOG and the Connecticut River Conservancy. And uh, so we're just going to go through some of those. Uh, bear with me. This is a little long, and this is, believe me, not even like probably half of what's actually happened in the watershed since 2011. Um, and if there's other efforts, we can discuss those afterwards. But. Uh, I started working in the watershed in 2011 before Tropical Storm Irene doing a fluvial geomorphic assessment of the main stem south river, so about 10 miles from Ashfield Lake all the way down to the Deerfield. Um, part of that project was to come up with uh, restoration ideas. What are some concepts? What are some options? So there was a list of 20. Seven of those have been at least partially put into place. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, this is a document you can find online. I just looked and FERCOG still has a link on the website. Um, it's published in 2013. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, I was just looking through this again, and I pulled out one of the figures from the report, and it was highlighting uh, this artificially straightened channel coming down along Shelburne Falls Road and pointing out this old meander here, this oxbow. And you know, we've done more you know, efforts with reconnecting that oxbow in uh, you know, later projects, but that was something that came out just right in the first time we ever started to look at the, the watershed, so that, that was kind of interesting. We also got a lot of great information from the Conway Historical Society. Um, this is an early blueprint from 1901, 1903, can't remember exactly, uh, showing the South River alignment in an artificially straightened configuration with these arrow straight segments uh, connected by 90 degree bends. Rivers don't naturally have a 90 degree bend. Um, the other interesting thing here is if you can see where you're sitting, this is labeled the old line of river. So this is evidence that the river was straight not once but twice before 1900. We also see things from the old maps and the archives like this is from 1871, but it points out those white arrows each point to a separate dam along the South River. Uh, within one kilometer there were three dams each powering uh, a series of mills along their length. So a highly manipulated river channel. We also found out about something called the 440 campaign in Conway. This was an engineering effort uh, that took place before the 1869 flood, um, where they, an engineer came up from, I think, Holyoke and uh, straightened the river for a distance of four miles from the Conway Reservoir, the Tucker and Cook Reservoir, upstream of the village all the way downstream, straightened the river, widened it to a width of 40 feet, and uh, took all the boulders, logs out of the river, basically built a nice straight canal to move water through as quickly as possible. And the reason they did this is they were worried that if the dam should breach in a flood, you know, it could take out the town, right? So they just preemptively made a canal to move all that water through. Um, so that's kind of interesting. You don't really find evidence like that uh, in most things. But that was kind of our introduction to the watershed and realizing some of the challenges uh, in the South River. Um, while that project was still going on, we worked with MassDOT to rebuild portions of the Route 116 retaining wall. Um, so these are pictures previous to restoration. Um, this is just downstream the Bullet Road. And you can see that there's a big void underneath the retaining wall, 
Well, the, this state highway came in in 1926, and as I said, they built the road right in the river corridor, probably filling in portions of the river channel. Um, when Mass DOT had a diver go under the road here, um, they found those voids actually went all the way to the center line, the yellow line of the road. Um, so they pumped, a, they call it grout packs, but they basically pumped a bunch of concrete in under the road. Um, the deepest part of the channel was underneath the road. Um, this image here is of the Route 116 retaining wall in Conway downstream of North Poland Road. And you can see like a rotational failure where some of these blocks are actually starting to, to rotate and fall into the river channel. So it lasted from 1926 till 2012, but it you know definitely saw some uh, some damage, right? The, the deepest part of your river shouldn't be under your road. Um, and so when this was rebuilt, my part of the project was to help with installation of these single stone boulder deflectors. This is looking downstream. Um, so the water comes down here, flowing along the road, the retaining wall, and then is turned back in towards the center of the river. So it's just a basic hydrology, you know, hydraulic you know, flow thing. Um, but we installed those while the, while the repair was being done, and um, they've been working pretty well. So there's a lot of sediment that's been deposited along the toe of the retaining wall. Um, this photo is from last year. Um, the river has been narrowed, so there's deeper water, which is good for fish and habitat. The river is narrower. And the deepest part of the river is down is actually out, kind of towards the center now, instead of being underneath the river. <coughs> um, then FERCLAW got another grant to do a river corridor management plan in 2015-2016. Um, and this included, you know, the original project was just the South River. This actually included all the major tributaries. So we mapped Pumpkin Hollow Brook and Poland Brook and Creamery, um, Johnny Bean Brook and some others up in Ashfield. Um, so all those were brought in. Uh, the, a lot of data was collected. We uh, came up with eight additional restoration concepts to add to the 20 from the first study. And we made something called River Corridor Protection Area Maps. Um, so this is some of that data. It, if you're interested, this report is on FERCOG's website. Um, but basically, you break the river into reaches. Reaches are broken into segments. Everything you could possibly measure is measured. Um, and then we prioritize. So if you want to know what part of the river you know, doesn't have wood, needs wood, you know, that's on this chart. You know, if you want to know where the bank erosion is most severe, that's on this study. Right? So we have all this information about habitat condition, uh, what's the substrate like, what's sediment transport doing in the reach, uh, what's the sensitivity to change in controlling watershed variables, um, and we map things like bank erosion. And so this is the number for the whole watershed. 25% of the banks were mapped as eroding, an additional 9% were mapped as armored. So more than a third of the bank length is unstable, right? That probably doesn't come as a surprise to anyone in this room today. Um, another part of this effort was a stream crossing prioritization. So we looked at things, we looked at 50 crossings, which are all the crossings on the major trips and the South River. Um, we looked at things like increased deposition upstream of a crossing. This is Adams Road culvert on Johnny Bean Brook which washed out this July. Um, we looked at things like uncontrolled scour downstream of an undersized crossing. This is actually a not very old box culvert that was put in on Creamery Road. Um, but you can tell by the depth and width of this scour pool downstream that um, it's not geomorphically compatible. What was the amount of use? Scour? Scour? Scour. Yep. Yeah, this pool here was, you know, at least six feet deep, probably more. Um, 
you know, scour here on Main Poland Road, also on Johnny Bean Brook. Um, and then, you know, some things were, while this bridge is a constriction, this is North Poland Road um, with these piers in the river uh, constricting it. Um, there's also an issue with this bridge in terms of just general disrepair, um, where you could actually go underneath the, these piers. Um, but right now, uh, we, you know, this one washed out in July and has been replaced. Um, we've got a permit level plan to replace this one. And Mass EOT has put in a temporary bridge at this location. And the plan is to put in a new bridge next year. Um, but stream cro crossing prioritization was done for the whole Deerfield watershed. And uh, there's a website, Shed Stream Crossing Explorer. Every crossing in the Deerfield watershed that they can go out and assess has been assessed for things like aquatic organism passage. You know, can fish get through the culvert? Right? Or things like um, the risk of failure here. And it's all color coded and ranked numerically. The risk of failure takes into account things like the channel slope upstream and what's the sediment uh, load coming down towards that bridge or culvert. They also look at things like disruption of services here in the right hand column. And that would be, you know, emergency responder <laughs> response time should that crossing go out. Or does a school bus use this route? You know, things like that. So there's a lot of tools available to help us figure out what crossings need to be replaced and how they should be replaced. And, and so all that information is available. Part of that came out of these projects we've done here. The last thing I want to talk about um, that came out of this 2015-16 project were the river corridor protection area maps. So we delineated the river corridor and we ranked it in terms of how sensitive is it to change. So is it extremely sensitive um, where you might have like a very dynamic stream where there's higher risk of erosion hazards? That would be this pink here. Um, but I'll back up a little bit and just explain what a river corridor is. A river corridor is the area that the river requires to reach equilibrium. So this would include the wetted channel, it include the bars, it would include a portion of the floodplain, any connected wetlands, um, and a portion of the you know existing confining terrace or um, upland slope. Um, equilibrium, to back up one further step, is the idea that the river channel adjusts its dimensions to its prevailing watershed conditions. So the amount of water and sediment that are, are available to the stream is what's going to define the shape of the river. Right? So the cross-sectional area, the width and the depth, will be determined by those controlling factors of water and sediment coming downstream. And as we know, there's a lot more water now, it seems like it at least, right? And there's also a lot of sediment now. So post-Irene, our rivers are continuing to adjust, and that's part of this equilibrium process. And so the river corridor mapping is supposed to map out the complete extent of where river processes may work on the landscape given the water and sediment loads that we're, you know, we have you know, prevailing right now. And we can you know, go through any questions about that later because that's a little technical, I, I realize. But then in 2016, we actually built one of these restoration projects from that first study where we came up with a list of 20. Uh, this is the South River Meadow Project. Hopefully, many of you have visited the site. It's a nice recreational asset for the town of Conway. Um, this was a town-owned cornfield called the Rose Field, um, just downstream of the Main Street Bridge on Shelburne Falls Road. We removed 3,500 cubic yards of sediment, lowering the floodplain three feet, um, and reconnecting the floodplain and the river, which is because of the straightening and everything that's gone there at the site. The river wasn't able to flood the floodplain. And so working with Davenport uh, trucking out of Greenfield, 
we lower the portion of that flood plain. Invasive species mitigation was part of this project. If you had gone down here before the fall of 2016, you wouldn't have seen the river because it was all Japanese knotweed and you know, rose bushes, uh, multiflora rose, the invasive species, and thick bittersweet vines. And so all that was removed and a continuing effort of invasive species mitigation has been ongoing. A lot of that led by Friends of the South River who also did a native trees and shrubs planting I think in 2020, uh, maybe 2021. So if you haven't been there, it's a great place. I encourage all of you to go. So floodplain reconnection and enhancement and building that recreational asset, asset on the floodplain was one part of the project. Another part of the project was dealing with some bank erosion along the right bank in front of this house here. Um, where after Irene, there was a vertical seven or eight foot high bank, um, kind of getting dangerously close to the corner of this house. Um, we installed four boulder deflectors, similar to those single stone boulder deflectors along Mass DOT, I just, uh, 3116 I described earlier. These deflectors are angled upstream and they turn the water away. So the river is flowing from right to left in this photo and getting turned towards the center. Since 2016, um, the river has narrowed considerably as sediment has been deposited between these deflectors. That's by design. They create like a slack water eddy along the riverbank. Instead of all the scour force being concentrated along the bank, that's pushed out into the center of the channel and you have deposition along that bank. And so. This woman right here is standing at the tip of one of these deflectors that's going off in this way. And this is all sediment uh, that's being colonized by vegetation uh, in front of that previously eroding bank. So this is you know, a sediment management project in a lot of ways. We're trapping a lot of sediment within the stream um, between these deflectors. We're also storing a lot of sediment out on the floodplain. Then uh, during COVID, we had an MVP grant, um, oops, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant, with working with Kirkog in the town of Conway. Um, so we came up with a lot of conceptual plans, and I'm gonna go through those right now. One of those plans is the Oxbow Reconnection Plan along Shelburne Falls Road. I mentioned this cutoff oxbow meander here um, along the street and channel. This plan involves reconnecting and redirecting flow through this oxbow. That would increase the sinuosity of the channel and, and reduce the slope. We'd open up a lot of good habitat, but we'd also take a lot of pressure off of Shelburne Falls Road, where we've seen damage here, here. Emerson Hollow confluence and uh, you know, down here we actually had an existing large mass failure landslide. Um, the top of this failure is just a few feet from the guardrail. Um, it continues to be unstable. Um, so this plan involved bringing the water, the river through here. There were some uh, allowances for the uh, a dry hydrant for the fire department, because this is where they get some water. Um, we had uh, stabilization of this landslide or mass failure. And also, this is the agricultural bank here. Um, some marginal log jams built along this bank to stop the erosion right, and create some habitat. So there was a lot going on. Um, also, a lot of buffer planting of native trees and shrubs. Kind of actually, it's not really shown on this image, but basically the whole way up and down here. So we have a permanent level plan for this, um, kind of waiting in the wings. We also did some work on a concept for flood storage near the Pumpkin Hollow and South River Confluence, just upstream of the Main Street Bridge. There's an old berm, it's granite block, 
Um, these are the actual blueprints from 1939, uh, which they referred to it as a dike. Um, but they rerouted the river in this area, and so we were looking at, you know, what sort of flood mitigation benefits can we have by breaching this berm? Unfortunately, in that project, we weren't able to go too far with this concept um, because of landowner access issues. Um, that has been you know, straightened out um, by efforts the town has made uh, with an easement. So now we are able to access this uh, forested uh, floodplain back here, and we are currently working on hydraulic modeling to you know, see what sort of benefits uh, work at this site could, uh, could give us. We also did two culvert replacements. Um, the planning, all the survey, design work for two culvert replacements. This one shown here is that this culvert on Main Fulton Road, this is upstream, this is the outfall. Um, this is a seven foot wide culvert. The plan that we came up with is a 15 foot wide natural bottomed, you know, probably precast sort of replacement, putting in something bigger. And just uh, interestingly, um, I was told by a landowner that before 1975, I believe, there was actually a bridge here. And then in the mid 70s, that bridge was replaced by this culvert. The other culvert replacement, which I don't have a slide for, was on Baptist Corner Road on the South River near the Cranston Tree Farm. So we have design work for that for crossing the placement as well. Another uh, potential project we looked at and came up with some specs for was uh, something called Chop and Drop Wood Edition. This is strategic felling of trees from the riparian area into the stream for the purposes of creating habitat and storing sediment. This is a, you know, a treatment technique that's used widely in the national forests. I've got some numbers and some photos from a project in Vermont that the uh, Forest Service did. That's where this picture is from. Um, you can see all the sediment stored along the margin of the stream here. So in a forested watershed like the South River, this is you know, something that could be a really good, you know, potential project. Uh, it's very inexpensive, um, and there's a lot of benefits. Um, and also, you know, reduced permitting effort. Um, trapping a lot of sediment on this one in the Green Mountains. This is the new river channel. This forester here is uh, standing at the edge of the old channel. So we've narrowed the channel considerably, storing a lot of sediment. Um, we did a pretty exhaustive study there in 2008. The actual project treated three sections of the stream, a distance of a quarter mile in total, 96, 97, and 2000. So we were there you know, 12 years after the first um, wood was put in the stream. They put in 169 pieces of wood, pretty high density of wood loading. Uh, but the interesting thing is that we built structure in the river, so this was a fairly featureless plain bed, straight channel, think canal. Right now we've got a step pool channel behind all these log steps on the longitudinal profile here. We've got a pool and we've got sediment storage and good habitat features. The channel was narrowed 15% over 12 years and we have a pretty impressive amount of sediment that was stored looking at about 30 to 46 cubic yards of sediment per year just in this quarter mile uh, stream, in this little second order stream. So if you extrapolate that out to a larger project, um, you can store a very significant <coughs> amount of sediment in these small streams. These are some other photos uh, of some work I've done in New Hampshire and in Maine. You can see all the organics stored in one of these chop and drop projects. You can see organics, think nutrients, right? So we're not just storing sediment, we're storing a lot of nutrients, um, but also immense amount of sediment. Which brings us to the current project. So that project, we came up with all these concepts. 
this project, we are focusing on flood mitigation. So we don't, as I said, we're going to have another meeting later in the spring where we'll come forward and with some you know, actual ideas for how these could translate to Conway. Um, but for today, uh, Rosalie and I are going to give you some case studies from the region uh, of ways to increase storage and increase conveyance to deal with flooding. Um, and just to remind everyone, uh, floodplain, what is the benefit of a floodplain? I'm going to be talking about floodplain reconnection. Well, floodplains are basically the safety valve for your stream because you can store water and sediment in those, flood, in those connected floodplains. Um, this will reduce the flood peaks and also increase the base flow. So instead of having such a flashy stream, a stream that has really good floodplain connection uh, you know, has lower peaks and, and higher base flow, so more constant flow of water, um, which has a lot of benefits for aquatic organisms, especially in the summer. <clears throat> it has a lot of benefits for landowners who don't want their basements flooded in, uh, in the rest of the year. So some case studies I wanted to highlight. This one is in Hinesburg, Vermont, which is south of Burlington. Uh, this was a town-owned uh, parcel. They had the town garage here. They were storing a lot of heavy equipment and fuel right within the river corridor. Um, so this project, they removed the berm, which you can see here, and they lowered the floodplain after they have moved all those municipal buildings and equipment outside of the, the river corridor. So this is the after picture. You can see the new municipal complex here, away from the river. This is the lowered floodplain that you can see. The river is already making use of this floodplain you know, shortly after project completion. This one is more interesting a little bit because they actually have some numbers uh, associated with it. This is the Dog River in Northfield, um, kind of north central Vermont. Um, they lowered three acres of floodplain and because one of the issues in Vermont and uh, all the rivers flowing to Lake Champlain is phosphorus loading, right? They've got these huge algae blooms. They're worried about all the excess nutrients coming into Lake Champlain. Uh, so they actually study how much sediment and how many nutrients were stored during one event in April 2019. And I don't expect you to read this, so I'll read it to you. They determined through their studies that 313 tons of sediment were deposited in this one April flow on that three acre lowered floodplain and 306 pounds of phosphorus and they go on to you know extrapolate that over the year uh, it's it's significant right and this is you know FEMA money um, in a you know, frequently flooded field they decided to to deal with it that way a project I was involved in was Long Creek in South Portland. This is right behind the main mall. If you walked up the slope, you could eat a Panera. Um, they had built something down in the floodplain, um, and we removed that constriction uh, and let the river get out onto the floodplain. So a couple months after completion, uh, this floodplain flooded for the first time in 50 years. Um, we added a lot of wood uh, to this system. This is the, all the floodplain here. This is the river channel right there. Um, so there's a lot of habitat. There's a lot of um, contact time between that water flooding in there and, and then eventually it floods out through this, uh, flows out through the small culvert. But during all that contact time, it's depositing silt, it's depositing sand, and it's also depositing all the nutrients and all the salt and runoff and stuff from the mall with its huge paved parking lot, um, you know, gets attenuated a little bit in this reconnected floodplain before going down the street. And of course, the one more local, which I mentioned already, the South River Meadow with the new floodplain. Um, this has been activated or flooded very often since 2016, several times a year. Um, these are photos from July. From July showing you one of these deflector veins turning water away from the 
but also showing the vegetation flattened and these huge sand sheets that are deposited. Um, and then Janet shared with me some photos from December where the river was up there again. And we have a lot of sand and uh, wood being deposited in that meadow. So it's working very well as intended. Another project which they have some numbers for is a place called Big Spring Run in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in Pennsylvania. This was a situation behind an old mill dam where they removed those legacy sediments, all that sediment that had been deposited in the mill dam. And underneath all that thick package of sediment was the old wetlands. And so once they removed that sand and silt, all those wetland plants from 300 years ago actually started to germinate. And they restored the wetlands by doing that. And these are their sediment load reduction calculations. Um, this was done in, I don't know, 2016-17 maybe. So over several years, they calculate 26,000 tons of sediment has been stored. And this is not a big wetland. It's, I think they removed 22,000 yards. So 3,500 was what we did at South River Meadow, 22,000, it's not, not too, too huge, right? Um, but they're calculating 100 tons of sediment is removed from the system every year. Um, and also, they have all sorts of nutrient loading uh, calculations. If you're interested, they've got a great website. Um, a more local project just is coming to completion right now in the center of Brattleboro on Whetstone Brook. Um, they restored a 12 acre floodplain, <coughs> which had previously been a kind of staging area for Sursosimo lumber. Um, they removed 40,000 yards of gravel fill, planted a 100 foot wide buffer, restored a wetland, and now, similar to South River Meadow, this is a park and recreational asset for the town. But this was done specifically to mitigate for flooding in downtown Brattleboro. A much larger scope project that actually didn't happen um, was on Winooski River in Waterbury um, near Montpelier. Um, this was a design done by Malone and McBroom, a big engineering company. They proposed some flood mitigation after Tropical Storm Irene where they were gonna lower this one privately owned hay field here of 13 acres, an average of seven and a half feet. They are gonna lower a state owned corn field, 15 acres for two feet, and another eight acre parcel for them, uh, lower two and a half feet as well. Uh, hydraulic modeling predicted um, a decrease of up to 1.1 feet in the 100 year flood elevation. So instead of having you know, two feet of water in your basement, you'd have one, I guess. I don't know. But, um, this is an expensive project, right? The, the cost was estimated at $4.4 million. FEMA would cover three quarters of that. Um, but you know, it's a big, big project. But this is the kind of thing that is being talked about regionally. This one didn't happen because of the landowner um, lack of landowner buy-in, uh, but this is the kind of thing that may happen more frequently um, as these sort of flood events uh, happen with greater frequency. Now I'm going to turn it over to Rosalie, let's talk about floodwater conveyance, and then we're going to have a discussion uh, at the end, so thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, so a lot of Nick's examples focused on floodwater storage. Um, the, it's all well and good to store water as much as you can upstream in the watershed, give it time to spread out, hopefully soak in the ground, um, but at the same time there's still water that needs to go and that's the concept of conveyance. Um, so the basic definition of conveyance is the act of transporting um, you know, a, something from one place <laughs> to another. Um, these photos here are in a more urban type of town this is actually in Milford, Massachusetts. Um, and the next slides I have are an example of something that was done several years ago, um, probably 
in the 90s or so um, in this town that's highly urbanized um, and they were having flooding issues. Um, so don't get too bogged down with this schematic. This was basically a graphic kind of showing how we modeled all the pieces. Um, and this was a project that was done by my um, superior when I started out um, at GZA. He, he had worked on this prior to me, but because we've been working in this town for so long, I have a good familiarity with this project. Um, so this is just um, kind of a schematic representation of the brook that flows through town called Godfrey Brook. Um, it's a tributary of the Charles River. And there's another tributary um, that connects to Godfrey Brook called O'Brien Brook. And um, they had, because what they had done in the 1930s with with this river was they channelized it um, using works project administration um, labor uh, because it was you know already in the early 1900s it was fairly urbanized so they said you know we want to we just want to get this water out of here so they built stone walls along these channels um, but as it became more and more developed you get higher rates of runoff and they were getting more and more flooding so they had a history of flooding in the downtown area um, and this is not an environment <clears throat> where you could say you know widen the floodplains or do more natural mitigation that really um, the way to deal with this extra water is to somehow get it out and around the downtown so they constructed um, a network of underground tunnels um, there was a 72-inch pipe that was built underneath, and then another one connecting O'Brien Brook. Um, and this basically, what happens is if you have, you know, your normal flows go through the, the channel at the surface, but then when the big flows come in, they get diverted to the underground tunnels, and then they're they bypass the downtown, the more developed area, and are released at a location where there is room for the water to spread out so it wouldn't have an adverse impact downstream. Um, we more recently looked at kind of a similar concept. Um, this is actually in Dalton um, where the watershed here is, um, it looks fairly undeveloped but, but the unique situation is that all the development is at the very bottom part of the watershed so um, you have water all coming together to the, the lower part of the watershed and that's where the problems arise um, so you know the upper part of the watershed is very steep and hilly so it um, produces that runoff that will feed the stream um, there is a little bit of storage at the middle part of the watershed um, but there were few opportunities to improve storage in the watershed here. And then through the more developed residential area at the very bottom, historically the, the brook was um, put into pipes underground. And then it comes out again. Um, you know, all this green section is all underground piping, and then it comes out before it goes into the, the next river that it's tributary to. Um, and so we considered, you know, what can we do here? The, one of the, we investigated this actual pipe and found that it was undersized and also kind of piecemeal, haphazardly constructed so that it might be big in one area and then would actually get smaller as you go, which isn't helpful for conveying that water through. Um, and in the end, we looked at some alternatives. We looked at the option of maybe even trying to open up some of this pipe so the water would have space to spread out, but it just wasn't in line with what um, the town was looking for in this area. Um, so the the existing pipe is the dark red here, and, it, and in this section it actually kind of goes through 
uh, people's backyards. So what we decided, rather than taking the existing pipe and trying to rebuild it, we thought it might be better just to put in a second pipe. And that way, we wouldn't have to disturb the backyards, the, you know, those residential areas, and actually put, put the pipe in within the right of way of the streets here, and then connect back up to the river. Um, I also wanted to touch on, you know, one source of flooding is, is storm water. So we're, we've, today we've been talking a lot about um, the, the water that's in the actual river, but, you know, the water that's feeding the river obviously comes from rainfall. It also comes from groundwater. Um, within the watershed, you get that rainfall that can soak into the ground and slowly make its way to the river. So that, that's why most rivers will keep flowing even when it's, it's drier conditions. Um, but stormwater is just that surface runoff that, um, you know, it's when the rainfall hits the ground and it, it has to either depending on the conditions on the ground surface, it will either soak in or if it's paved or more hard pack, or if it's been raining a lot and there's just no room to soak in, it's gonna run off. Um, so sometimes stormwater needs to be controlled to avoid causing flooding downstream wherever it goes. And so um, often that's done using detention or retention or providing systems where it gets trapped and then can slowly be released to the downstream areas. Um, another aspect of addressing stormwater runoff is to uh, capture it and then give it space until it has time to soak into the ground. And in some cases, we'll use subsurface storage, um, you know, direct it underground into these like, perforated pipe systems or other systems where it will store until it can soak into the ground. Um, and then if you have kind of smaller scale situations where you have the space, um, what's interesting about stormwater is ideally you can capture it at its source. So rather than taking a whole bunch of pipes and just uh, compounding to where you have a huge amount of water to deal with, if you can capture the stormwater runoff closer to its source and then allow it to infiltrate into the ground, um, then you're avoiding situations where you have much higher uh, peak flows coming to a downstream area. So this photo is just an example of a rain garden where you have the, the local runoff that comes into this area and can soak in. Excuse me. Uh, yep. Sorry to interrupt. What was the center picture you were showing us? What is uh, that? So that's the construction of subsurface <coughs> infiltration galleries. Mm -hmm. So those are large, um, it's like a bed of gravel with perforated pipes that are interconnected. Yep. And so if um, in this particular example, I think is at a hospital where they needed more parking. So eventually it would get paved over the top, but the runoff that's coming in will go underground and then soak in. Um, you know, the old traditional way of doing it would have been to just pave it, put in your storm drains with your catch basins, and then have those shoot the water down to the brook. Um, so that's the alternative. Um, I wanted to show this example where um, it's, it's kind of an opposite thought. So I talked about taking extra water and putting it underground. Well, this is a situation where in Meriden, Connecticut, they had taken the whole river and put it underground. Um, and they were having severe flooding in downtown Meriden. And so um, they designed a whole series of techniques to address the flooding. And this was, this is kind of like their, I guess, keystone big project where they, it just so happened that they had a big open um, brownfields parcel that I think had once had a mall, but the buildings had been removed and the river was in an underground tunnel right through that parcel. 
So they took all that space they had available and they daylighted the river, allowing it to have room to, to flood, you know, when, when the floodwaters came in. So during, you know, typical normal conditions, it's a park, but then when they get a lot of rain, it will flood up. Um, this project did also include other measures such as um, acquisition of properties. You know, in some places they they wouldn't be able to take away the flooding from those specific locations, so they would they did um, include acquisition of properties. I don't I so my involvement in this project was when they wanted to get state permitting. We did kind of more of a peer review and assisted with the permitting side. We did not design the project, so. I'm not sure where they're at with implementing all of the various measures throughout the watershed, but they have um, constructed this part. I think it's been a huge help in the city. And um, this is a project that I worked on with Nick. Um, this is, so the city of Northampton purchased an old golf course and there was this uh, brook running through there called National Line Brook. Um, and they didn't necessarily have flooding issues um, within the golf course, <coughs> but they wanted to return, they wanted to be able to remove all of the man-made manipulations to this channel and return the watershed to nature. They were seeing downstream impacts from, this, from where the brook leaves the golf course um, with high levels of erosion. So this channel was highly manipulated and I can go through that a little bit. Um, so Nick did the geomorphic assessment on this brook and it was obvious that the channel was disconnected from its floodplain and former wetlands. The golf course had implemented um, measures to drain drain the land as quickly as possible to keep it dry, to keep the, the playing fields dry. So, um, and they also straighten the channel. You can see in this, whoops, sorry, this photo here, there's boulders here. They, they channelized the brook. They even put filter fabric in the bottom of the brook. Um, and then when you go off of the golf course downstream, there was severe erosion here. Um, and w especially with climate change, had, as Nick had mentioned, the property downstream was owned by Mass Audubon, and they were concerned about the erosion they're seeing on, you know, through their property. So we prepared a restoration plan for the brook through the golf course, which would involve removing culverts. There were a lot of cart path crossings and um, they weren't sized appropriately to convey the flow. Um, at, you know, adding planting, plantings, restoring the channel, uh, lowering the, the floodplain um, to, so that the water is not just being shunted along the brook, but has room to spread out. Um, and then there were also a couple of dams um, because the golf course had built those to get water for irrigation. Um, so these are the set, a variety of measures that could be taken together to improve the use of this parcel as storage um, and prevent the excessive flow of water downstream and adding to this erosion issue. Uh, so I think Nick was going to wrap it up. Sure. So these are the next steps for this project. Um, so as I said, right now uh, we're working on the existing, existing conditions hydraulic model. So we took the topographic digital elevation data, the LIDAR, that's been available for the watershed since 2015 when they flew the whole Deerfield watershed. Um, we added to that with a lot of survey that was completed this fall. Um, and so we're building a model of how water flows through Conway. 
in Conway Center specifically. Um, once that is done, we um, can you know, build the existing conditions model where we can propose different mitigation efforts and see what benefits those you know, efforts get us, basically, right? So one of the major parts of how we get there is with uh, landowner outreach. Um, so we're available to meet with folks, talk to people, email, go out and do site visits. Um, just trying to figure out how flooding is impacting people uh, personally and what sort of ideas we can come up with as a community to you know, mitigate those challenges. Um, so we hope to identify five potential projects um, that we can model. Um, and from those, we'll select two which we will bring to a you know, conceptual design uh, level um, that you know, in the next project you know, could hopefully move towards implementation. Um, so we are working with Allison from FERCOG and with Veronique, uh, town administrator, to you know, look for more grant funding for implementation projects and uh, you know, as I said, that last MVP project came up with a whole host of plans um, that are basically ready to go. You now we just need money to do them, and we need landowner buy-in to say, yes, this is what we want to do, right? Um, so that's kind of, kind of where we're at. Uh, we will be having a community forum um, where we are going to you know, present the findings from the, the model. You know, hopefully, we can get some ideas today of you know, what people think might be some you know potential things from your from your side um, so that's kind of it now we just wanted to open up the you know the floor to discussion and questions um, we're all healthy, uh, happy to answer them um, just some pictures there to kind of focus your mind <laughs> yes is there anything um, in Conway that has the danger, like the phosphorus, going into Lake Champlain? Um, I, good question. I don't know uh, if there is a you know, big nutrient loading source. Um, Burkhog has done some studies on you know runoff nutrient loads in the past. Um, it depends, like one source of money that is available that we've tapped into before is something called the Long Island Sound uh, Fund. There's more, more complicated yeah. than that. Long Island Sound Futures Fund. Futures Fund. And so that was um, after Tropical Storm Irene and Hurricane Sandy. Um, a lot of money was put forward, I think initially $15 million, but I think they maybe added to it or maybe annually add a little bit to it. Um, and that is to reduce sediment loading for Long Island Sound. So the South River flows into the Deerfield, Deerfield into Connecticut, all empties into Long Island Sound. And during Irene, there are some really good pictures of you know aerial photos of all this huge plume of sediment going out into Long Island Sound. So there's money to reduce sediment loading. Um, I, you know, I think about sediment because I can see it. Um, but like sediment and nutrients are kind of hand in hand. So if you're reducing sediment, you're reducing nutrients. Um, does that answer the question? Oh. Hi, I'm Ron Kohler from Ashfield. And um, I was wondering if you guys and all your research, thank you, first of all, for the presentation. Appreciate it. If you folks had done water, complete watershed studies, uh, I've asked around because I'm curious as to the watershed above Asheville Lake, which ends up in the South River, of course. And I've been told that there isn't complete information. And I'd be um, highly supportive of you guys doing one of your projects and really knowing all the data that ends up in the South River. I've been told that generally Asheville Lake contributes 5 to 10% to downtown Conway, but it's just rough and approximate. And I'd like to know real data. Right. Um, so that 2015-16 study where we looked at the tributaries, um, a couple of them are unnamed, and they um, 
start above Ashfield Lake. Um, one that crosses 112 um, by the, uh, the dairy farm there, goes under, kind of banks right, and then eventually en enters a Creamery Brook. So we studied that basically as far up as we could off of, was it Bird Hill Road or something? Um, and then the, the other brook that starts by the Ashfield, by the Sanderson Elementary School and crosses over and um, that goes down and also enters Creamery Brook um, but like from a dip across like Briar Hill Road. Um, so both those were included in that 15, 16 study. I'm curious in the one that is over by Harrison, right? Yeah. The reservoir in that capture up there that ends up in the lake. Okay. Yeah. We didn't specifically look at that, but if there, I mean, I we've got all the GIS sort of computer mapping data um, and all the topography. So if there are specific questions, you know, maybe I could work with you. What we're trying figure to figure out what we can, you know. Is we're trying to help answer. predict periods of inundation mm -hmm. and to mitigate the amount of water that goes into the South River, draw down the lake sufficiently to capture, retain, detain water so it doesn't contribute to the, uh, the flooding. And so we just need data. You know, right. we, yeah. it's very bootstrap now. What we do is if it's going to rain three inches, we'll multiply that by two and a half, we'll draw down the lake eight inches, but it's still, it's all, it, there's very little data on, it's all trial and error, and right. uh, it's a lot of water flows over the dam. Yeah. Do, you, do you see any prepared a hydraulic model of the watershed, of the South River watershed? Um, it's, it's a coarser level because it's the whole watershed, but then taking that Right now, what we're working on is making it less coarse and more specific for the downtown Conway, but that could be potentially a starting point for a more detailed model of the upper portion, you know, associated with the reservoir. Thank you. Um, it seems, well, water s flows downwards, right? So all of the problems that we have with water concentrating in these lower areas um, is exacerbated by all the steep slopes that we have. And I think it would be useful, I mean complicated, but useful to think about mitigating some of the water, you know, you talked about storing water in the ground and stuff. To, so to do some of that slowing down of the runoff that's coming off of our slopes, even though they've got trees growing on them and thick, you know, composted leaves and all that, if it's really steep, the water still will tend to run off fast. And, and I mean, Field Till Road is a perfect example. It's a very steep hill. The road, you know, is like prone to erosion anyway because it's just loose soil. And um, if there were some mitigation of the water flowing down the slopes like that, then it wouldn't end up being so concentrated in our streams and rivers. So, you know, related to what you just said, you know, your problem is also exacerbated by the hills around the area, you know. So I, I mean, I think that that's part of the, the issue here. We can't just ignore, we can't like treat where it's like concentrated and intense, but not deal with where it's coming from, you know. So um, I live on a, a flat <coughs> spot between a steep slope and another steep slope. And we've added a lot of water mediation because I was worried about the water coming down to our foundation and hitting our foundation and then freezing and breaking the foundation. So I did a lot of stuff to remediate that edge, the back edge of our house, 
and it's really helped when we moved to our house there there's a porch that's on concrete piers and the con the force of the water and the freezing and everything had moved the piers so that the the posts that were supposed to be supporting the porch were like barely on the piers anymore. And that's not happening anymore. So, I mean, what I did really did help. So, you know, there, were, I mean, and I was just doing rain gardens and gutters and stuff like that and, and swales and rooting the water through the landscape more. But I mean, you could build that out on a bigger scale and do it you know, in the, in the hills, and, and logs, and things like that. Anyway. Yeah. Set on a bigger scale, the more you, these are small measures, but the more of them you have, right. the better impact it has. Right, and it, where the slopes are especially steep, it's really important. Like off of Fields Hill Road, there are those two, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's those two streams and the culvert had, it, it totally washed out the road. And there were, yeah, so one of those, the, the stream is so, the slope is so steep that it really eroded a huge, like, I don't know, 10 foot <laughs> drop through the soil. You know, it's really powerful, so. It, it would help so much areas like that, you know, to do, to do yeah. something. Yeah, you're right. So um, anything that happens needs willing landowners. Um, and, you know, one of the things like that I highlighted was the chop and drop, and that's about storing water and sediment in the uplands. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, there's lots of little things people can do, you know, having a permeable driveway instead of you know blacktop maybe you know just simple things or like French drains and you know different different little things you can do on your property which are you know, you know cumulatively have benefits right but right. Yeah. this might be off the mark but does any attention or will any attention be directed to the southern tier of town Bradford Brook which flooded pretty dramatically last summer and Possibly, in fact. Um, this project is supposed to be focused on the center. Right, um, of course. And that's where the modeling is focused, but um, I don't know Bradford Brook. Maybe we should talk later. You can, you can tell us now, but. Our property is on the Williamsburg line. Uh, flooding in Williamsburg made popular press pretty dramatically last summer. We had several thousand dollars in remediation just because of a dam at our bridge. Yeah, we had to re reinforce the bridge, but the river rose seven, eight feet yeah. and flooded a huge swath of land and created you know, quite a mess. So that, is that like Roaring Brook here? Is that that part of it? No, Bradford Brook runs essentially north-south, but of course the whole ridge line finds its way to the brook where three man-made ponds have flooded. All of us were impacted, as was Williamsburg, just to the south. Yeah, I, I, I think... In fact, our bridge washed out. Right. Officially, we're not looking at that, but you know, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about it. My thoughts. Southern Tier is an often neglected part of town. <laughs> like by the... That's what happens. That's all. So I live um, at the base of Pine Hill and Upper Baptist and Baptist Road and own the sea plane, but the sea plane is larger than my property. That's directly above town on the north end, and that's related to the flooding that happens at one sea plane. And the watershed studies do not include the drainage from Pine Hill Ridge, which is very out of control in a number of different places, impacting primarily houses, um, both on those roads as well as below us. We're at 600 feet, the top of the ridge is 900 feet, the river valley on the floodplain, different from the sea plain, is, um, they're not like, they've been connected and disconnected and roads have moved in slightly different ways mm -hmm. over the entire history of the but um, the amount of mitigation
condition that's required is likely above most people's individual property capacity. But it's affecting all the houses. All the houses are flooding right. or wet in ways that um, are quite different than historically over 400 years, uh, over the 40 years that I've lived there. There's clay. It's not just that it's got a rock surface coming off of Pine Hill Ridge. It's that there's clay 12 and 18 inches below the surface, and it's shooting across at high speed. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, that's the kind of information that I think yeah, is I valuable to, for us to hear. Yeah, and then the other thing that's happened with atmospheric rivers is the wind has shifted and knocked huge amounts of trees down. Also, the water that moves across the seaplane and then down the hill is impacting the stability of the trees quite quite substantially. We took out 15, we've taken 50 large, 70 year old and older trees out of our property in the last two years. 15 of them. So that changes the hydrology in and of itself. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd uh, like to talk to you. More and kind of see what we can think about that area of town. Uh, we'll put it on Main Street. Um, two part question. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming out because um, you've given me a great deal of confidence that there are a lot of smart people thinking about this stuff and we're not just subject to what we have, but the possibilities are, are there. So, two parts. One is what's the typical funding recipe for any of these projects and what can we do as a local community to get the attention of other funding agents typically like the Long Island, Save Long Island Sound, or whatever that is, um, natural resources, fisheries and wildlife. We're talking about creating with the chop and drop, for example, we're talking about creating uh, micro ecosystems. So, how do we get more of our projects funded by somebody else? So that's number one. And then second piece is a maintenance question. And uh, along with that too is we, we had a lot of damage from flood in July. The, the word was we had 21.3 inches and it was the largest rainfall in North America, not just the United States, in the month of July. And word on the street is we're not getting state funding. Ooh, we did, okay, so it did come through. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm out of the loop. Because um, I, I saw the property taxes going way up. Um, so the second part of, of my question is that if you're digging out uh, a floodplain, let's say the Rose property, you're coming down to an engineered specific two and a half feet below where it is. If you're doing the chop and drop, which I love the idea of, because you're not bringing anything in. You're just dropping a tree, it's renewable. After a certain number of floods, as you had mentioned, the river is gonna silt these things full again. So the question has to do with maintenance within the context of the original project plan, will the state have this on the calendar so that um, 12 years from now when the white oaks deteriorate and now you're just left with the sediment, that a state crew comes in and drops more trees so that the next big flood, that sediment isn't just lifted and carried away. And likewise, with a property that is like the Rose property here in the center of town, where you have a floodplain, it's essentially engineered to have a certain capacity. And you were talking about uh, 13 tons or 33 tons in Vermont that uh, of the, the phosphates and sediment that are not going into Lake Champlain, that's 13 cubic meters. It's sounds like a lot, but it's not really a lot unless you have a lot of capacity for each subsequent flood event. Um, so the question for me is, 
how do we make sure that 10 years from now when these logs rot away or 25 years from now when the Rose property comes up to its brim with sediment and it's not doing its job, that the state can come in and say, look, this is what we agreed to 25 years ago before everybody who made that agreement was dead. And either we're going to drop the trees that are now growing in the sediment or we're going to come in with equipment and, and uh, haul it out again so that it lasts for another 25 years. And thanks again for coming. Can I take the funding question? Sure. Um, so for funding, you know, there are a lot of um, grants out there from the state and federal uh, government and um, Allison with FERCOG, they're very good at helping towns get grants. Um, and you know, how, how do you compete? How, do, how would Conway compete for those grants? Is, you know, coming to events like this, showing that you care and um, supporting the uh, development of, of match money, a lot of these grants, they do want the towns to put in a little of their own money. And sometimes the match can be labor, you know, so there, there are ways to deal with it. There are also creative ways to take one grant program and use that as the match for another grant program. Um, so I think, though, you know, and Allison might have some more ideas on, on the funding aspect, but and maybe she can talk about that with you after, but that's just yeah. what I thought I would say about the funding. So there are, you know, money, there is money out there. Um, in Massachusetts, there's 319 money, which paid for the South River Meadow project. That's specifically about um, sediment load reduction. Um, there's uh, municipal vulnerability preparedness grants, which Conway and I think Ashfield are both uh, qualified for. Um, so there's, Conway has set itself up well to be, you know, able to, to qualify for a lot of different pots of money uh, that the state has available every year. Um, and Burkhog's really good with the grants, as Rosalie was saying. Um, so we're working on that part. Um, but there's also, you know, more infrastructure money, you know, at a federal level that, you know, we notice in our day to day, you know, kind of percolating down through. Uh, and I think the town got $1.25 million, so just about, um, just awarded um, to help pay for some of the damages from 2023. So that's thanks to Phil and the select people for, you know, keeping on top of the politicians. The, so uh, the good thing about both floodplain reconnection projects and this chop and drop are they shouldn't require much maintenance. The reason that we have to do chop and drop is because um, past forestry project, you know, for past forestry management, you know, we don't have for a lot of forests where the um, the trees are aging out and dying on their own, right? If you go out in the woods, you know, maybe the trees are 30, 40, 50 years old, and they're still going to live for a lot longer, you know, but. In this sort of setting, we have to add trees to the brook, you know, artificially because the trees aren't old enough to be dying by themselves. Yeah, so, you know, the thought is in 20 years when those logs rot away, you know, there'll be natural recruitment of these older trees, you know, toppling in, you know. Um, so that's the, the chop and drop part. The floodplain reconnection part is if you lower a floodplain or breach a berm, there's no going back. There's nothing to maintain, you know? Like, if you, if you have a constructed project, you might have to go back and deal with it. If you're just removing uh, a barrier to flooding, that barrier is always going to be removed. You know what I mean? It's not, you're, you're worried about maybe the, the Rose property a grading that full three feet. Um, and maybe that would happen, but it would probably take hundreds of years, I would imagine. So it seems to me, to follow up, that 
that would be under the heading of what engineering or colluvial engineering might include because you know how many yards of soil silt came out of that floodplain. Yeah. And you know what the silt load is, so you know what the um, what the age of that much engineering is going to do. So you know 25 years from now that it, so there are two parts to that. One is opening up the floodplain. In other, in other words, removing the berm so that the river at flood can um, take its top off into the floodplain. And then the second is how long is that floodplain going to last? Because it's got to have a useful life. And for me, I look at this sort of conversation as, you know, let's look at it within a 10-year capsule that Conway is deciding that we want to do X, Y, whatever it is. And 25 or 30 years from now, they're not going to really understand what we were thinking then. So if it's written into the engineering plans now as part of a maintenance concept, just like anybody has with their house, um, it'll save a lot of disagreement and ambiguity at that time. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, and I think it's important to look at life lifespan of any practice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is a good idea. Like a lot of times, um, they'll put in, um, when you get a permit for maintenance and monitoring, um, usually it's not 25 years, it might be five, three to yeah. five years, but um, that's something that, you know, <laughs> It's good to hear you say that because that kind of, you know, can be something we work towards, you know, maybe. But I do think it would probably take centuries, you know, or more before, you know, that floodplain fills. Centuries are growing up through that stuff time too. So. Yes, yeah. Because floodplains are supposed to flood naturally, right? Like you're supposed to get a little bit every year of silt and sand deposition. So that's just a natural process. There was one question. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gala Elwell, Shelburne Falls Road, uh, South Rubiso Company, and Natural Roots, which has gotten really hit quite a few times. Uh, Nick, what about the chop and drop? Did I hear you say that it's less permitting needed? Yes. Any permitting needed? No, you still have to get a permit. But, but it's just, you know, a person walking with, you know, chainsaw. Right. Um, so there's no heavy equipment in the stream. Um, there's a lot less, you know, to have the permit. So okay, good. Um, pretty sure. Thank you. And thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Rosalie. Just one housekeeping thing. There was a sign-in sheet going around. If you could, that would be wonderful. If you could sign it before. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well done.